The locavore or bioregional movement originated during the 1980s with the proliferation of locally oriented microbreweries, renewed emphasis on local foods, and the advent of agritourism. It is now expanding into a broader movement that seeks to relocalize many aspects of our economies. It was and is an inevitable antidote to globalization, a process that has expanded access to consumer goods, homogenized our commercial life, and centralized everything. Somewhere along the way, mom and pop and the once ubiquitous service industries that were so local in every aspect died or at least were so weakened that it has taken determined effort and a growing cultural movement to reimagine local alternatives. This program, Going Local, is about the swirl of trends and tendencies that have given new vitality to aspects of our cultures and economies that are locally grown. We will discuss the pros and cons of globalization and homogenization as the basis for rekindling of local spirit and, to the point, how placemaking, design, historic preservation, and tourism are all affected by societal trends. History furnishes these rare, sporadic instances where a particular event at a moment in time proves transformational. Such was the world of 1968, the year when the crew of Apollo 8 took the, a, a photograph described as the most influential environmental photograph ever taken on Christmas Eve, shown in the lower right there and known as Earthrise. That same year, Stuart Brand published the whole Earth catalog which uh, Apple founder Steve Jobs compared to the internet search engine Google, describing it as one of the Bibles of my generation, a periodical that was idealistic and overflowing with neat tools and great notions. Uh, Jobs adopted the farewell message from the back cover of the 1974 edition, Stay Hungry, Stay Foolish, as his personal slogan, and it was in this idealistic spirit that 1970's Earth Day and the environmental movement were born. Very much aligned with the spirit, historic preservation exploded forth about the same time. In 1968, few could have foreseen the impending globalization of the world economy, the decline of the American industrial economy, and the attendant cultural and economic Im influences. Today, Americans are more inclined to see themselves as victims of globalization rather than the beneficiaries of it, though clearly it has worked both ways. Uh, Benjamin Barber's book, Jihad vs. McWorld, put forth a theory that describes a struggle between McWorld, globalization and the corporate control of the political process, and Jihad, uh, here uh, to, meant to mean traditional and traditional values, uh, and he questions the impact in this book on economic globalization. Uh, Chinese, di famous Chinese dissident artist Ai Weiwei, uh, I think one of the great works of art of our time is this uh, tribal jar with Coca-Cola emblazed on it. I think it pretty much says it all. And yet at the same time that the corporate, political, and technological conditions that gave rise to globalization were coming into play, uh, Wendell Berry, a poet, philosopher, and agrarian writer from Kentucky, uh, emerged with a voice and vision for a kind of relocalizing of culture and economy that uh, continues to be a force today. He writes about the need to shorten our supply lines so we know where we are economically. He talks about promoting the people should promote at home and encourage abroad the idea of local self-sufficiency and that how a community protects its own production capacities it does not import products that it can produce for itself and uh, also how the kind of regionalism that he adhered to is local life aware of itself a particular knowledge of the life of the place one lives in and the value of local knowledge Forty years later, terms and ideas that weren't even imagined at the time have become uh, mainstays of our popular culture and uh, the movement, the sense of place movement and the move to relocalize aspects of our economy is vigorous and well underway. Absent the disaster, the uh, bi-local movement is never going to quite replace the 
dominance of the global economy. But, you know, it's interesting how the arguments are made. Ten top reasons to buy local. It strengthens the local economy. It's certainly true. It supports one's neighbors and community groups. Makes your community more unique. It's invest in your community. And it encourages local prosperity. These are all compelling reasons. In 1984, Carlo Petrini, an Italian, founded the International Slow Food Mov Movement. He first came into prominence for taking part in a campaign against the fast food chain McDonald's opening in Rome. Slow food was the anti-McDonald's, local, indigenous, nurtured, nurturing, and social. In 2004, he founded the University of Gastronomic Sciences, a school intended to bridge the gap between agriculture and gastronomy. He was chosen as one of Time Magazine's heroes of that year. At the end of the day, culture is about values and memory, and part of the foundation of the uh, localization movement and this interest in local foods is in, revolved in reflecting on our agrarian past. These are some views from Old Sturbridge Village, which captures a world that we lost in the Industrial Age, and now we are losing the Industrial Age. So it all prompts, I think, a certain level of reflection. Depending on your point of view, I suppose globalization has been a steady ascent or descent from a time when self-supply was the way of the world, self-sufficiency, relatively speaking, much greater. And if we go back to the agrarian times in the agrarian world, not only did communities feed themselves and clothe themselves, but they provided their own housing. And that housing itself had almost a tribal quality to it in that it was indigenous, distinctive, and had a strong place-based element to it. Those were houses from the Connecticut River Valley. Uh, the regions of America had architecture and cultures really as distinctive as a thumbprint in those days. Localism prevailed. Upper left, Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Upper right, Woodbury, Connecticut. Lower right, Jeremiah Lee House in Marblehead, Massachusetts. And in the lower left, a uh, brick house uh, in the uh, New Jersey, Pennsylvania area. Inside the houses, the furniture was as localized, also as a thumbprint. Uh, most furniture makers uh, served a clientele that was no more than 20 miles from their home, and uh, again, styles changed over time and over space. The cultural geography of early American furniture is astonishing. The uh, Pennsylvania German uh, Cupboard on the upper left, New York City, uh, card table upper right, Connecticut River Valley, scallop top table lower right, Philadelphia in the center. Amazing geographic vari variety. Today, perhaps 95% of the things we eat and use and consume are imported at some distance, while in the agrarian age, those that ratio was almost the opposite. Perhaps only 5% was imported. This is uh, silverware from Connecticut. Even local blacksmiths found a way to express themselves artistically in their in the production of uh, door latches and other iron goods like these. While ceramics were one class of goods that were often imported from England and Asia, even during the 18th century, domestic redwares had strong geographical place-based uh, differentiation. Then there are gravestones, some of our earliest indigenous folk art, as geographically distinctive as a thumbprint. One of the most costly and time-consuming pursu pursuits in early America was the production of textiles. This eventually led right into the industrial age, but uh, most farms had the capacity to do at least some spinning <coughs> and weaving. To really understand the impact of globalization and the degree to which self-supply and locally grown industries have become a kind of aspect of our past rather than our present, I would like to share a case study uh, from the place I know, one of the places I know best, which is New Haven, Connecticut. 
New Haven began to industrialize on a significant scale in the 1830s, and it really took off with the advent of the arrival of the railroad in the 1840s and 50s. A dizzying array of uh, things produced there in some industries where it was a real specialty of the city. Uh, at the height of its game, the oyster industry in Long Island Sound employed 50,000 people, and New Haven was one of its leading centers. Eli Whitney and the Winchester Arms Company were two of the most iconic names in machine-based manufacturing, firearms, and invention, both in New Haven. By the 1880s and 90s, New Haven's largest industry was manufacturing carriages and vehicles for the horse-powered era. Uh, it was the leading production center for this, uh, these kinds of objects in the United States. There were at least 20 manufacturers of carriage or carriage components in New Haven, again an industry that employed tens of thousands of individuals and had international markets by the end of the 19th century. Clock making existed in colonial New Haven, but it, again it really took off on a massive scale in the 1840s and 50s of the New Haven Clock Company, which again uh, achieved uh, national and some international markets. Look at the scale of the L. Candy and Company rubber shoe and boot works in the Worcester Square neighborhood of New Haven, and it wasn't the only shoemaker in New Haven. Manufacturing the machines that made the products, the machine tool industry had, was a high prestige value added industrial concern that New Haven specialized in. H. B. Bigelow and Company manufactured these enormous steam boilers in New Haven. The New Haven Folding Chair Company ramped up during the Civil War, producing camp chairs for the war effort. After the war, they produced invalid chairs, some of the first what we would now call wheelchairs, uh, and a great many other products. Corsets, cigars, monuments, melodeons, and pianos. This was an industrial boomtown. Beer making is always kind of a cultural marker of a community. New Haven had three, and these don't look like microbreweries, quite large. From the upper left, the Rock Brewery, Lion Brewery, and the bottom, the Weeble Brewery in New Haven. At the height of the urban age, at the turn of the century, New Haven was a city of about 200,000 people that expected growth rates to continue to such a point that by today there'd be a million. In fact, uh, today the population is smaller than it was a century ago, and this kind of bustling sense of urban life and this sort of proliferation of local industries, local shops, it's a world we have lost. There's no doubt that a modern Home Depot probably has 20 times the quantity and perhaps even higher quality than, than these dozens of small independent-based businesses that characterized places like New Haven a century ago. But look at what retail looked like at that time. Clothes, hardware, groceries, and trade services, not only were these enterprises local, but they were replicated throughout the city on a neighborhood basis. These were services designed for a walking city. Some towns were transformed by a single industry. The town of Westfield, Massachusetts, by uh, 1900, produced about 80% of the world's supply of, of whips, horse whips, used in equestrian transportation, stock breeding, and elsewise. By 1880, there were maybe 15 or 20 whip manufacturers in Westfield. I'm not sure any of them employed more than 200 people, but the industry continued to grow. And it was the basis of the community's employment, including jobs for women and many immigrants. Well, particularly after 1850, when water power, coal, and railroads began to supplant water power as the source of the Industrial Age, uh, there were these small communities on rivers that uh, also would sometimes have local industries. This is the Hitchcock Chair Factory in uh, rural Litchfield County, Connecticut, that again at one point employed more than 200 workmen. Another industry that originated in the rural area during the water power era was the Noble and Cooley Drum Factory, which amazingly is still in business in Granville, Massachusetts. 
Writer Wendell Berry observes that the experience of growing up in a community in which virtually everybody was passionately interested in the quality of a local product was, I now see, a rare privilege. This was certainly true in places like New Haven in the 19th century. You can see here that even then they had a Buy New Haven Made Goods campaign. There were annual trade shows and there was a lot of promotion and self-consciousness in the way these locally based industries were managed. Well, it was really only in the 1950s and 60s after World War II that Connecticut's industrial base began to dissipate. Uh, certainly as recently as the 1930s, uh, there were hundreds of these businesses. Almost every town had one in these annual and industrial expos where they would showcase these products and do shop talk and network and it was really a, again a cornucopia of the industrial age. While Detroit, Michigan is the kind of the poster child for the ravages of the post-industrial age with you know millions of square footage of factory space abandoned, uh, New Haven is not uh, unfamiliar with this as well. This is uh, the Winchester factory as it looked a few years ago. Uh, they no longer manufacture firearms in New Haven. At one point, it probably produced, you know, 15 to 20 percent of the nation's products, firearms products. While a few museums are beginning to collect machine tools and other uh, essential elements of the industrial story, this is pretty much where a lot of that stuff ended up in scrap metal and in dumps, and uh, it's over. I mean, this aspect of American history has passed. But curiously, after World War II, as industry wound down, agricultural products and other efforts to identify a place with some aspect of economic activity began to ramp up. Vermont, uh, famously, is a state that has actually been able to brand certain kinds of things, dairy products, and in this case maple syrup, in a value-added way that uh, have contributed to the development of their economy. The old joke in Vermont is that nobody noticed the depression because it didn't change anything. Vermont had seen basically no growth from the Civil War until the 1960s. But in the 1970s, uh, some really novel ideas about food and place-based branding emerged. And one of the most iconic developments certainly was the Ben & Jerry's ice cream factory up in uh, the Northeast Kingdom that, uh, of Vermont that uses local dairy products to produce a local product. The Cabot Creamery uh, doing the same thing with butter and cheese. While the concept barely existed in 1970, agritourism is now growing everywhere. Agritourists can choose from a wide range of activities that include picking fruits and vegetables, tasting honey, learning about wine and cheese making, or shopping at farm stands for local and regional produce or handcrafted gifts. It is one alternative for improving the incomes and potential economic viability of small farms and rural communities. As people have become more interested in how their food is produced, they want to meet farmers and processors and talk with them about what goes into food production. Farmers use this interest to develop traffic and interest in the quality of their pro products. Writer Wendell Berry notes that today most of us cannot imagine the wheat beyond the bread or the farmer beyond the wheat or the farm beyond the farmer or the history beyond the farm. Here in North America, the farmers of French descent on the Ile d'Orléans in historic Quebec uh, have made a tremendous industry out of agritourism with all kinds of f festivals and events and activities almost year-round. One of the most popular attractions and one of the most popular destinations in the United States is the Charleston Tea Plantation, America's only tea garden, where you really see uh, from source to gift shop the production process of one of the most exotic ind agricultural industries still practiced in, in North America. 
I happen to live in a section of Connecticut known as the Tobacco Valley, where tobacco farming goes back 200 years. Cigars were produced here as early as 1808. There's both shade-grown and broadleaf tobacco, and uh, while the number of acres under cultivation is probably a fifth of what it was in, in the 1950s, it's still a fairly large industry and one of the defining identifiers of this place. Since tobacco and smoking became a little politically incorrect, there's a lot less attention to this local homegrown industry than there used to be, even though it is still making uh, money and keeping a lot of farmland under cultivation. In the 1940s and 50s, there used to be an annual harvest festival, C Cigar Tobacco Harvest Festival. There is a uh, uh, WPA uh, Depression Era art that uh, captures the character and allure of this industry and again it is still part of current events. Community gardens and farm stands are a colorful picturesque aspect of uh, rural life in New England and other parts of the country. One of the most influential developments of the past quarter century is the proliferation of farmers markets. Uh, in Connecticut, we have a farmer's market trail that networks some of these farmer's markets, and some of them uh, track 10,000 people on a weekend. It's an amazing phenomenon. The renaissance in local farm production and farmer's markets has uh, triggered a uh, farm-to-table movement, in which there are now literally hundreds of events around the country at museums, at uh, community organizations and universities where the local agriculture becomes in a sense part of the learning where people come to have a whole dinner in which all every aspect is locally grown. One of the oldest and most famous uh, public markets in the United States is the Pike Place Market in Seattle, which opened in 1907 and is one of the oldest continuously operated public farmers markets in the United States. It's a place of business for many small farmers, craftspeople, and merchants, and is one of Seattle's most popular tourist destinations. On the upper level, uh, you'll find fishmongers, uh, fresh produce stands, and craft stalls operating in the covered arcades. Local farmers and craftspeople sell year-round in the arcades from tables they rent, allowing consumers to meet the producer. All of this spawned what one wag at New York Magazine described as the artisanal delirium. Artisanal cheeses, artisanal uh, pies and uh, beers, and it is, again, the revival of process, the return to handicraft, and the interest in locally grown products where the artist and the producer become almost a cele celebrity. These products tend to be quite high-end and I suppose if people had to uh, pay a premium for everything in their lives they, they uh, would think twice about buying local but for food and, and to sort of perishables, it's really begun to work. And here's an interesting business from Savannah, Georgia, the Savannah Bee Company, that makes all kinds of products based with bee products and beeswax and honey. Arethusa Farm in Litchfield is uh, what one might almost call a designer dairy. In fact, it was uh, founded by um, the uh, uh, high-end shoe manufacturer in uh, New York City as a kind of a hobby project that has become a significant industry where they produce milk, a cheese, ice cream, yogurt. Located in the rolling hills of Litchfield Farm, Arethusa has a proud tradition of raising award-winning purebred Jersey Holstein Brown Swiss, Swiss cows with the uh, motto that great milk comes from great cows. And these are, these are kind of pampered animals and uh, it's, it's an amazing uh, uh, production. The most famous agritourism destination in the United States has got to be the wine regions of the Napa Valley. Uh, it's a billion dollar industry. Hundreds of thousands of people travel there from all around the world to do wine tastings and you know it's just experiential retail. It's kind of an amazing development uh, uh, north of uh, San Francisco. 
just like with museums and other facets of tourism, agritourism really depends on quality programming, the ability to put together festivals and special events, to brand your products, to create an image, to leverage the history, uh, to make a sense of uh, uh, an experience is what it's all about. Complete with their own foundation, the Be Good uh, Burger Company, a Boston-based chain, uh, Boston area chain, uh, again uses uh, quality products, farm to table uh, uh, marketing, and uh, when you go in, you, you learn about their supply system. The farmers actually have photographs on the wall of the actual farmers that grow their potatoes, and the farmers that grow their vegetables, and where they acquire their meat from. Again, it's all part of tapping into the zeitgeist of the agritourism uh, movement. Starbucks famously globalized a trend that was uh, really also took root in the 70s and 80s with the uh, uh, advent of uh, coffee houses and cafes uh, that, where, that really emphasized uh, high-end products and, and uh, a real kind of homey, community-based, independent atmosphere. Locophilia and the buy local movement has also been spurred by the kind of made in the USA trend uh, where uh, people are branding and marketing products uh, kind of the opposite of what is at Walmart which is you know things that are made uh, of quality here in, in the country uh, here's a Boston based company Ball and Book uh, Men's uh, Clothes uh, whose mission is um, to team up with the best American craftsmen pro to produce a brand that offers the finest quality made USA products Tired of declining product quality and the growing trend in outsourcing manufacturing, they left their day jobs to pursue the American dream. A lot of it's marketing and branding, but it's again part of this trend. If food can be locally grown, why not art, why not music? Uh, great talent doesn't come from nowhere, and if a community wants to nurture its artistic culture, it needs to support the artists that live there. Uh, there are places like Austin, Texas, famously in Nashville, that have made uh, local industry out of uh, music. But uh, the local music scene uh, can be nurtured and developed anywhere. And it is, again, part of building a strong brand and identity for your community. Leave it to Portland, Oregon to have uh, created a whole sort of volunteer-run organization about knowing your city and placemaking this Dill Pickle Club has bike tours and uh, thematic tours and potlucks and all kinds of events that foster this kind of urban renewal, renaissance, all place-based. It's a wonderful spirit that is there. The ultimate expression of going local is the creation of uh, place-based festivals that agri that ag support and nurture, again, local foods, local talent, local expression, and uh, there are places like Quebec City in the upper left, and uh, I love the little garlic festival in uh, uh, Massachusetts on the lower right, and Lowell, Massachusetts on the lower left. Uh, lots of places have developed festivals that uh, become the catalyst for all of this sort of place-making energy and enterprise. Local history and community-based cultural organizations are in the midst of a renaissance. And uh, in Vermont, the state of Vermont has this fabulous history expo uh, where uh, community organizations, local historical societies have a booth and there's just, you know, it's kind of a three-ring circus for several days once every other year. And I think it attracts almost 20,000 people and it's really a performance catalyst for these communities. Historic Morgantown uh, and even San Francisco has a history as expo. So what gives with the National Trust for Historic Pr Preservation for constantly flogging out of outside non-domestic uh, uh, travel options uh, to its members. Uh, we need to be better at this. And I mean, as preservationists, if we can't take our own side in the argument, who's going to? Uh, obviously, the cruise ships are 
uh, not friends to local tourism, at least not in the locales here in the United States, that need the attention. And, you know, I always like to say that if you have to board a plane for fun and recreation, perhaps you're living in the wrong place. Um, every place has qualities of interest. The key is to nurture and develop those and also to promote them effectively. I don't know if it didn't last or if it's just getting started, but when the uh, economy tanked in 2009, 2010, there was a big brief spurt of interest in this new concept of staycations. Well, obviously, the travel industry doesn't love this, but it's a great idea for our states and communities, and it's what really state uh, tourism offices need to be better at promoting this. How you can, you know, again, if the people who live in a place aren't enjoying and ex really experts in the content of their own communities, who's going to be? Gosh, and what a blessing the seven or 8,000 community-based repositories of local history are to us. There are house museums and historical societies and community museums in almost every county in the United States and in literally thousands of towns. And uh, these really do a lot of the heavy lifting. If you want to learn about your community, this is where you start. And it's interesting in terms of, you know, what's old is new again, that uh, the kind of places people care about, the places that uh, seem to be the most competitive and able to support independent businesses and achieve that sort of difficult goal of becoming kind of a walking pedestrian scale environment that people love, places that do that best look a lot like the places that existed, the urban places that existed before the age of the automobile. The before and after pictures on the uh, left and right are instructional. The upper picture is South Norwalk, and the lower picture is Portsmouth, New Hampshire, but uh, you get the idea. These are places that matter. I always say that like charity, tourism starts at home, and really uh, place consciousness also begins at home, and it has to be nurtured. If I had a magic wand, place-based education or place-conscious education would uh, be a ubiquitous feature in how our children learn about life and about the humanities and about science and the arts. Alas, expect some pushback. The locavore movement and uh, the whole quest to create strong sense of place isn't for everyone. There are huge moneyed interests invested in really creating colonies out of our communities and in this, again, con constant descent of globalism and the centralized uh, uh, marketing and distribution products. Uh, if we want to have independent, self-defined, self-sovereign communities, we're going to have to uh, take our own side in the argument. Uh, economically, there's some aspects of it. You know, uh, I'm glad we can get bananas off season uh, and other aspects of the modern 10,000-mile uh, uh, supply chain for food, but uh, these aren't necessarily mutually exclusive. They can coexist, and we need to do more to nurture the, the soft side that uh, nurtures community life. Two of the writers and thinkers who have influenced me the most are Lucy Lepard and uh, Wendell Berry. In On the Beaten Path, Art, Tourism, and Place, and in another book, The Lure of the Local, Lepard discusses art, museums, community, land use, and how the physical and cultural environment affects our lives. Uh, she recommends more intensive engagement and interplay between art and the environment, and is was really one of the great uh, art critics of the uh, 20th century. Of course, Wendell Berry is almost an icon. He is... Uh, written uh, almost 50 books uh, as a National Humanities Award uh, uh, recipient and um, is arguably the uh, sort of a godfather of the sense of place movement, an agrarian whose writings and musings about place and locale are inspirational and have been ongoing since he helped form this uh, uh, concept and this culture back in the 1960s and early 70s. Wendell Berry writes that if the word community is to mean or amount to anything, it must refer to a place, and that a viable community is made up of neighbors who cherish and protect what they have in common. 
We can't preserve historic buildings, he notes, to any purpose for very long outside the context of community life and local economy. Lucy Lepard observes that we are living today in a state of alienated displacement from and longing for home, longing for the fragments to be brought together. This can't be done without a context, a place. A starting point might be simply learning to look around at where you live. Further, she notes, few small towns yearning for business have any idea of the attractions hidden in their back streets. Part of the process of looking around is listening to each other. Okay, well, that's it. If we are drawn and inspired by the lure of the local and wish to literally make sense of place, we need to start by immersing ourselves in the peculiar and particular elements, both past and present, that make one place different from another and, more importantly, make for the, a richer sense of place, past, and community. A strong sense of place is the basis of civic attachment, which is the basis of trust, which is often a prerequisite for st strong local communities. The famous slogan, once a favorite among the bumper sticker crowd, called on us to think globally and act locally. I never could understand what the heck that was about, so I fixed it by reversing the words. What we really need to be better at is thinking locally. As Wendell Berry puts it, you can't act locally by thinking globally. If you want to keep your local acts from destroying the globe, you must think locally. If you want to preserve things of value or enrich your community's culture and economy, you must also think locally. That's what going local is all about.